loss of self is something that we associate both with strongly positive uh, conditions and with profoundly negative conditions. So, in a fairly crude kind of categorization, under some circumstances, we regard loss of self as a pathological and distressing condition. So, people with Alzheimer's disease, people suffering from psychotic states, people in various states of abjection, if you like, the abject poor, the abject chronically, those in abject and chronic pain, the chronically ill, and so on. And uh, as a kind of little experiment, I thought uh, today, what do you do, what do you get when you put loss of self into Google? What's the first hit? And the first hit is a paper by the sociologist Kathy Sharmas from 1984, whose title is Loss of Self, a Fundamental Form of Suffering in the Chronically Ill. Then there is kind of what I'm going to call normative or benign loss of self. Normative in the sense that we regard it as being part of everyday circumstances and we regard it as being, broadly speaking, I would say, benign and certainly not distressing. So under conditions of significant concentration in what the psychologist um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi has called flow, where people are very absorbed in a task, um, in conditions of sleep, daydreaming, and as in the phrase that we use, lost in thought, when people are um, deeply involved in something either external to themselves or their own thoughts. And I regard that as being, as I say, sort of normative and benign. And then there are, if you like, exceptional and empowering uh, losses of self that are associated often, it's kind of the sex and drugs and rock and roll and meditation. <laughs> so under all of these uh, circumstances, people often experience profound and powerfully and positively powerfully um, uh, strong sensations of their of the loss of self in some sense and amongst those as well as sex and drugs there is music and in a rather extraordinary book by the Swedish psychologist Alf Gabrielsson that was published in 2011 called uh, strong experiences with music uh, Gabrielson, in a 10-year kind of ethnographic project, talked to, I think, more than a thousand Swedes, because he's Swedish, about their um, strong experiences of listening to, record, uh, listening to music. Um, usually people reflecting back on what was one of the most, or the most profound experience of listening to music they can recall. And I thought I'd just give you a couple of them with a soundtrack to go with it. So middle-aged man in the 1970s, uh, recalling rather the situation in the 1970s, he writes, the gentle beginning of the song of Stairway to Heaven. The gentle beginning of the song was just perfect. It was like I belonged to the music, melted in with the notes. The music crawled inside me. Or was it me that crawled inside the music? In some way, that was all that existed. And writing of pop music, Giles Smith, in a book called Lost in Music, writes, there is nothing like pop for centering yourself in yourself, listening through headphones, which even now is my favourite way to hear things, to sink into them, seal off, so there's no distraction. At which point, Pop was not a soundtrack to your life, it was your life. And these experiences, of course, not confined either to pop music or to popular writing about music. 
So here, also from Gabrielson's book, is a middle-aged woman. So it's not just middle-aged men either. <laughs> so a middle-aged woman recording listening to the Beethoven Third Piano Concerto from some decades earlier. She writes, it felt as if I sank all the deeper into a great and universal concentration. Then and there, every part of the music that reached my ears became a part of me. And the first and second movement as a whole, that was me just then. I was inside the music, and the music was inside me. It wasn't possible to distinguish one from the other. And similarly, T.S. Eliot in the Quartet's writing of music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. So, as I say, music... Is, is associated with these very powerful experiences of a kind of both a loss of self in some sense and also a discovery of some other kind of self or the self within the music and the, mu and the music within oneself. And the question is kind of how can we begin to understand why this happens and how this happens. So I'm going to make a distinction between two kinds of consciousness. This comes from, the, the, the terminology of this uh, comes from two people who have written about it. Um, Gerald Edelman, who is essentially a biologist, and Antonio Damasio, who is more of a psychologist and neuroscientist, who respectively have, called, have talked about the distinction between primary and higher order consciousness in the case of Edelman, or core and extended consciousness in the case of uh, Damasio. So, primary or core consciousness, they write about, as that state of being, uh, of kind of current awareness, the contents of the perceptual present, present of something that is pre-linguistic or non-linguistic. They say that this is a kind of consciousness that is, that is true of human beings, but it is actually also true of many other mammals, certainly other primates, and they, they claim probably quite a lot of other higher mammals as well. And this primary consciousness consists really of three components, a kind of dynamic sense of the perceiving external events, a sensory motor engagement with the world, so an engagement with the world, a distinction between the self and what is not the self, it's important to, to, to have some sense of one's dis the, the distinction between self and other in some sense, and these two kind of processes guided and regulated and evaluated according to what they both call a kind of value system, but not a value system in any sense like a sort of social value system, but a value system that is very strongly connected with the biology of an organism. It is to do with literally pleasure and pain or distress, to do with homeostasis, to do with the preservation of the integrity of an organism and with the maintaining of an adaptive relationship with its environment. So, Damasio um, talks about this relationship, I'll come on to higher order extended in a minute. Damasio talks about this kind of constant process of having a, this dynamic engagement with events, about the distinction between self and, and non-self and this value system in this phrase. He writes, the story, because this is a kind of, we can imagine it a bit like a narrative, although it's a completely wordless narrative. He writes, the story contained in the images of core consciousness or primary consciousness is not told by some clever homunculus, nor is the story really told by you as a self, because the core you is only born as the story is told within the story itself. You exist as a mental being when primordial stories are being told, and only then. Now, in a sense, in, in the rest of what I say today, I'm mo mainly talking about this kind of primary consciousness um, context, but it's of course it would be crazy not to recognise that overlay built upon that, if you like, is the massive edifice that we are primarily aware of, and that is higher order or extended consciousness, that kind of consciousness which we might say is quite similar to what we would call self-consciousness, that capacity to reflect upon these primary experiences, to have some kind of perspective on them, to predict them, to reflect back on them through memory, and so on. And Edelman writes, because be human beings have higher order consciousness, they cannot subjectively experience or reconstruct primary consciousness without the intrusion of some additional components of higher order consciousness. 
Now, Edelman takes a rather kind of hard line on this and claims that primary consciousness, although it kind of in a sense sits below higher order, sorry, primary consciousness, because it's, although it sits below higher order consciousness, becomes essentially unreachable because of this, this layer of language and culture. I'm a bit more sceptical about the complete unreachability of it, and of course many kind of, again, meditative and, other, and religious practices um, would claim that that's exactly what they are trying to do. And arguably, um, some kinds of aesthetic experience are also attempts to reach back into primary consciousness. So what is primary musical consciousness like? Well, of course there are different kinds of primary musical consciousness depending on whether one is playing or listening or composing, I suppose you could have or improvising. I'm going to concentrate really only on listening. Um, I'm going to kind of make the claim and not do terribly much to substantiate it, actually, I'm just going to make it. But um, the main thing that's going on when we are listening, either to the general auditory environment or to music, is asking ourselves the question, in a sense, although not in a linguistic way, what's going on and what shall I do about it? That's, that's the kind of adaptive relationship with our, our environment, is that we're interested in what's happening in an environment and what, how we should be relating to what's happening. And what's going on in music are various kinds of things. Music both has a real world, a world of instruments and bodies and actions and room spaces and kinds of recording technologies and so on. It, it, is, it is manifest through real objects in real spaces doing real things. And it also has the capacity to specify what I've called in other publications a virtual world, a world of objects that we hear in musical materials and of actions and of bodies and spaces and motions and structures and emotions that have no palpable real existence in um, the actual world in which we hear them. So the sounds that I played just earlier of um, you know, Jimmy Page playing the guitar on Stairway to Heaven, they, have no, they, they existed in a virtual world while I played them to you, rather than in any real world. We recognise them as coming from objects that we would recognise if they were here, but we know, because they're coming as loudspeakers, that they are not here and now, just as the same way as when we see the face of a newsreader on television, we don't imagine that that person is somehow confined within the now flat screens that we see them on. So here is um, from a really fascinating book by a, po a woman who is now a postdoc working in Oxford on a British Academy postdoc grant. At, um, she's associated with the faculty and is at Jesus College, Ruth Herbert, in a fascinating book called Everyday Music Listening, Absorption, Dissociation and Trancing. She has some fantastic examples of people trying to describe what it seems to me is this kind of primary musical consciousness. So this is a person, Max, who has... Um, some background in music, but is not a, a, a musicologist in any sense, listening to the radio in the bath. And he subsequently writes down his experience. One of John Taverner's masses for a cappella choir comes on next, utterly transported by never-ending rising and falling of long, drawn-out polyphony, purity of human voices only, eyes closed moment, aware of the monochromatic, colourless textures, little variation or contrast, but beauty in voices and in cathedral acoustic, endless phrases washing around, partly conscious of how Latin words are mostly soft vowel sounds, totally transported to choir boy days and how it felt to sing in a grand setting, filming images of candlelight and shadows, monastic liturgical rituals and so on, attention very much inwards. So what this person, and this is characteristic of many of the examples she has in her book, is trying to describe is, first of all, what's extraordinary is the kind of, the, the, the swinging across um, very broad kind of contextual categories about, you know, cathedral acoustic and the, the whole sort of um, spatial and, and cultural um, context that this music seems to specify, and at the same time, incredibly detailed properties of um, the human, the, the voices and the vowel sounds and, and, and so on. So th th there is a sense of this tremendous multiplicity of, um, of kind of stuff in consciousness or stuff trying to find its way into consciousness that this person is trying to grasp through, through language. <laughs> 
And this question of multiplicity, actually, is a, a, a rather um, striking one for, for theories of consciousness in general, quite apart from theories of music. So Daniel Dennett, philosopher um, who has written uh, about consciousness, writes of consciousness and about the problem of what is it that we are that, that, we, that, that comes to consciousness out of the enormous variety of things that we might be attentive to. What he writes is this, there is no single definitive stream of consciousness because there is no central headquarters where, quote, it all comes together. Instead of such a single stream, however wide, there are multiple channels in which specialist circuits try to do their various things, creating multiple drafts, he calls this a multiple drafts theory of consciousness, creating multiple drafts as they go. Most of these fragmentary drafts of narrative play short-lived roles in the modulation of current activity, but some get promoted to further functional roles in swift succession by the activity of a virtual machine in the brain. He goes on to write very much more than I could talk about today, but rather more about why it is that some get promoted. I will leave that for the moment. So let's look at a rather kind of, again, perhaps slightly simple-minded list of attributes of music that might make it kind of somehow have some rather particular relationship with consciousness. So one of the things that is widely discussed about music is its non-semantic quality, non-semantic in the, in the strict sense of not having a semantics like language. Secondly, its temporal character that is kind of dynamic and um, temporally processive. Thirdly, that it is ambient in the sense of being spatially distributed and therefore, um, in principle, immersive. And actually, in, in an era of, era of recorded music, that has become even more the case. That um, whilst when music was always produced by, uh, by sources which were in front of one at the time, there was a sense in which music perhaps had a more focal quality, but in many recorded music, in, in listening to recorded music, we're often confronted with music that, has, that comes from all around us in all kinds of ways and is not localised in, in a simple space at all. Thirdly, that it is itself, as consciousness is, multiple, polyphonic in the, in the very general sense of that word. And we can think of, of uh, Dennett's theory of consciousness as being a kind of polyphonic theory of consciousness, just as music in many cultures, in most cultures in one way or another, has polyphonic quality. Further, that it is embodied in the sense that uh, musical material is made by human bodies and has a, has a tremendously striking capacity to engage human bodies as um, uh, a kind of response. That it is, it, it occupies an incredibly broad spectrum between the solitary and the social, that in general music is made in very social ways, but we also have discovered ways of doing, of, of musicking, as Christopher Small calls it, of musicking in extremely kind of solitary ways, the headphone listening that Giles Smith talked about at the beginning being one such kind of example. And um, Georgina Bourne, a colleague here in, in uh, Oxford, summarises a kind of many of these properties in, in, in the following kind of uh, pithy sentence. Music is perhaps the paradigmatic, multiply mediated, immaterial and material, fluid, quasi-object, in which subjects and objects collide and intermingle. intermingle. This is the opening of an actual very interesting paper published in the journal 20th Century Music about music and mediation. So, with these kind of properties of music and the kinds of properties of consciousness that I've um, been discussing, perhaps this is one way to see why it is that music has this powerful capacity to engage ourselves, our subjectivity, our consciousness, in a way that it both feels like a surrendering of ourselves to musical materials and at the same time a kind of discovery of a different kind of self or a transformed self or a transformed subjectivity within musical material itself. 
And in a very interesting paper um, published in 1998, two psychologists, Roger Wash, Watt and Roshin Ash, did a very simple thing. They just played some short extracts of music and asked people to rate that music on a very large number of adjective scales, some of which were adjectives that could be applied to people and some to landscapes and some to um, materials and some to objects and so on, a whole variety of adjective scales that referred to kind of different domains of human experience. And there, the object of this study was to find out what kinds of adjective scales can people use to describe music in a kind of stable and systematic way. And again, cutting along the story very short, they found that those adjectives that were adjectives that could be used to describe people were also adjective scales that were used stably and kind of, if you like, reproducibly in relationship to musical materials. And from that experiment, they make the rather kind of startling con uh, conclusion <coughs> that it is proposed that when music is perceived, it is assigned attributions that would normally be assigned to a person. These attributions are made to the music, not to the composer or the performer. Loosely speaking, music creates a virtual person. And this idea that music itself, again, just repeating what they write there, not the specific person of the composer or the performer, or the performer or performers, but that somehow musical material itself is a kind of uh, a, 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 an expression of, you could say, although that's, that becomes too representational, but is the instantiation of a kind of human subject in, kind of embodied in musical material is an idea that has actually run through quite a lot of um, recent musicology. By recent, I mean over the last sort of 20 years, people have been writing about the way in which music can be heard to be a kind of very powerful expression of human subjectivity, and indeed to be the expression of a human subjectivity that we in our kind of everyday lives um, may not have access to, or, or, or rather that it provides us with access to kinds of subjectivity that are um, particularly compelling. So Naomi Cumming, a philosopher and violinist, who uh, wrote a brilliant article in 1997 about the um, Bach St. Matthew Passion Aria Air Barnadich, uh, which I will just play the opening of first. So she writes, in fact, only of the violin introduction rather than the singing we heard. The pathos of Bach's introduction is quite unmistakable, and recognition promotes empathy. Once involved with the unfolding of the phrase's subjectivity, the listener does not, however, find a simple reflection of his or her own expectancies. The music forms the listener's experience, and in its unique negotiation of the tension between the striving and grief, it creates a knowledge of something that has been formerly unknown, something that asks to be integrated in the mind of the hearer. And finally, before I move on to sort of uh, some conclusions from this, Tia Denora, a sociologist who's written a lot about music, 
tackles the same question, but from a rather more kind of sociological perspective. She writes, viewed from the perspective of how music is used to regulate and constitute the self, these solitary and individualistic practices, she's, re she's responding to a point that another author makes about how music is a solitary and individualistic practice. She writes, these so-called solitary and individualistic practices may be reviewed as part of a fundamentally social process of self-structuration, the constitution and maintenance of self. In this sense, then, the ostensibly private sphere of music use is part and parcel of the cultural constitution of subjectivity, part of how individuals are involved in constituting themselves as social agents. So all of these kind of um, statements about music and subjectivity imply a rather kind of positive perspective on it, that it is an arena in which um, we can discover something about ourselves, that we can both let go of something about ourselves and discover something different about ourselves. It's worth recognising that there is, as I put it here, a kind of dark side to that, um, that capacity of music, that just as music can be used for if you like, um, emancipating and enlightening and um, transforming processes, so also it can be and has been used as an instrument of oppression, social control and torture. So to finish with then, what then might be the kind of mechanisms, if you like, or explanations for the capacity of music to engage the human subject and to gain consciousness in the way that I've been um, well, one broad category, and this is an area, again, that's suddenly become very kind of much discussed in, in a certain area of music research, at least, is um, music's capacity to act as a kind of vehicle for or medium of empathy between uh, people. The word, the, the, the German equivalent word, Einfühlung, which was coined by the philosopher Robert Fischer and, and um, kind of popularised or... or yeah, by, by Theodor Lips, who uh, was somebody Freud admired very much. Um, the word Einfühlung, in a way, conveys this more, though the capacity to feel into another is uh, something that has been held up as something that music allows us to do. And one way of thinking about this empathy or Einfühlung has been um, in terms of our, the, the, the relationship between sensory and motor um, properties, the way in which um, another person's actions can become actions that we understand ourselves and feel in ourselves. So the way in which you can hear, as I slightly need to at the moment, the way you can hear when someone needs to cough, <coughs> that you almost feel it in your own throat, or as another point points out, when you see someone bite into a lemon, that sense of your own salivary glands going wild at the thought about what's going on for them, and so on. So our capacity to understand other people's distress, there was an extraordinary example actually in the newspaper about a year ago of a woman who had a very profound kind of sensory motor <laughs> um, awareness of other people and who um, lost consciousness when she saw someone out in the street being hit in the face and being knocked over by another person. So powerful was her sense of what was happening to this other person. She found herself lying on the floor, having been knocked out, as it were, by the blow that had knocked this other person out. One way in which neuroscientists have talked about this is in through what is called the mirror neuron system, which, as may, some of you may have heard of, is, is one way in which um, to understand why it is that the actions of others may be an internalised as if being like the actions of ourselves. A third way in which people have thought about why music engages us in this kind of way is through properties of entrainment, about synchronised behaviour. Again, there is very interesting um, <clears throat> empirical evidence that if you get people to, to do synchronised things together, they behave in much more generous, uh, spirited, and so-called pro-social ways towards one another. And actually, Emma Cohen, who is a fellow here in the college, uh, a, a, a fellow in life science, in human sciences, um, was one of the authors in a very interesting study looking at rowers rowing together. And it showed that, that when rowers, ro when, when, you, when they perform joint actions, um, they have higher levels of endorphins in their brains, like these, these kind of endogenous opiates, these kind of feel-good um, hormones, if you like, um, than when they expend equal amounts of energy, um, but on their own. So it is something about the synchronised sociability of rowing together that has these particularly powerful effects. Um, a fourth way in which people have tried to think about this is through 
uh, the, 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 the sense of our ability to take another person's perspective, so-called theory of mind, which I think is a very bad term, actually, for, for a good idea. Um, and even Piaget, the, the developmental psychologist, talked about the way in which children have to learn um, to decenter, as he put it, to learn to understand another person's point of view. Um, a fifth way in which um, this has been theorised is in terms of what's called emotional contagion. If you put people in a room and some people are experiencing certain kinds of emotions, it tends to have a kind of con contagious effect on others. It's been shown that music can act, again, in this kind of virtual person-like way, as a, kind of, uh, uh, as a kind of origin of a sort of emotional contagion. Um, and finally, um, there is a kind of sense in which uh, music and musicking is a kind of performativity, and here the, the gender theorist Judith Butler has written a lot about how ourselves are, it is, we are, ourselves are something that we perform rather than something that we have, and that music engages in that, this kind of social construction of the self in powerful ways. And finally then, uh, and this, Christina Howells, um, again, a fellow in the college, wrote an extraordinarily interesting book, um, in two, published a book in 2011 called um, Mortal Subjects, that's the title, um, in which she, she uh, considers from a whole lot of different philosophical perspectives ways in which our openness to the world, our incompleteness, is um, really the key to an understanding of our own subjectivity, and it is summarised in the kind of Sartrean phrase, qui perd gagne, the loser wins, the one, he or she, who does not try to keep everything together and engages with the world in the sense of openness is the one who kind of gains most from it, and she summarises it at the end of the book. It is precisely our failure to achieve self-identity, so our failure to just sort of build ourselves up out, only out of positive bricks and mortar, if you like that allows us to be free. Our non self coincidence our pour soi, which is ridden by self-division and is never soi, our diasporic subjectivity provide the key to our ability to change and to choose who we want to be. Thanks very much. And folk music mean when they say, as they often do and have done since the middle of the 20th century, that they prefer their music to be real, quote unquote. Uh, perhaps it's easier to start in the negative with what these fans oppose and what they believe is not real. Music that is artificial, glossy, synthesized, soulless, impersonal, overblown, or, as the sources I've been looking at put it most often, slick. In contrast to this, musicians and their fans desire a return to a simple, rugged, honest, unpretentious, and even archaic music. And this has been one of the most consistent arguments in 20th century pop music culture and aesthetics, running through jazz, folk, punk, and more recently, indie rock. Accompanying this desire is almost always a staunch opposition to the commercialization and professionalization of music making, and even a ret rhetoric of democratization. While an aesthetics of simple, rugged, honest, and unpretentious music uh, can be found in greater or lesser qualities surrounding most jazz and rock music, my d thesis focuses on the more extreme lengths to which popular music subcultures have gone during the past 60 years in pursuit of authentic reality, venturing beyond the simple and the rugged and into the exotically primitive. Though these musics maintain an apparently progressive stance which, uh, which opposes the industrialization of creativity and its norms of taste, this primitivist aesthetics is ripe for critique, since it has tended to be projected onto the socially and culturally marginal, such as poor and or rural musicians, and even people with mental illnesses and disabilities. As art historian Colin Rose explains, the word primitive generally refers to someone or something less complex or less advanced than the personal thing to which it is being compared. It is conveniently defined in negative terms, as lacking in elements such as organisation, refinement and technological accomplishment. The fact that this primitive state of being is comparative is enormously important in gaining an understanding of the concept, but equally so is the recognition that it is no mere fact of nature. I am particularly interested in the way this primitivist aesthetics responds to matters of technical and technological capability in popular music, 
and especially the process of recording. The comparative or negative aspect Rhodes sees in primitivist aesthetics is reflected in the label given to the music I'm looking at, which is lo-fi. This term arose sporadically from the mid-20th century as the opposite of hi-fi or high fidelity, the, uh, or, or the post-war sonic equivalent of today's HD videos, if you like. Since 1976, the Oxford English Dictionary has defined lo-fi firstly as sound reproduction less good in quality than hi-fi. <laughs> <laughs> This usage initially came from journalistic commentary on consumer sound systems. But by the early 1990s, the term lo-fi had come to refer to a style, sometimes it's considered a movement, uh, within folk and rock music that was technically lax and usually recorded comparatively poorly, especially at home. Thus, since 2006, the OED has also defined lo-fi as a genre of rock music characterized by minimal production, giving a raw and unsophisticated sound of designating or belonging to a genre of rock music deliberately recorded on basic equipment using simple production techniques in order to achieve a raw and unsophisticated sound, and unpolished, amateurish, or technologically unsophisticated, especially as a deliberate aesthetic choice. Notice that this definition doesn't actually refer to music. There are newspaper articles that refer to lo-fi holidays and such things, so the term really does go, get very broad. Uh, essentially, my research is focused on where, how, and why these categories arose. I give the name lo-fi aesthetics to this growing appreciation for unsophisticated music, and the name lo-fi effects to a range of different technical and technological characteristics that signify lo-fi music. These include playing wrong notes, or playing out of tune or time, but as reflected in the term lo-fi's initial reference to low fidelity, I'm particularly attentive to the reception of what I call recording imperfections. These include phonographic imperfections, that is, the imperfections that are generated in the technological process of recording itself. Deliberate or not, phonographic imperfections include tape hiss, overdriving and saturation of sound signals and the resultant noise, loss of signal or dropouts, reduced or over-resonant frequency response, the altering of pitches, both constant and in, in a cyclical warping effect, and the audible operation and manipulation of the recording equipment, so hearing people play, press stop and start. The category of recording imperfections also includes non-phonographic imperfections, which might be considered to make a recording imperfect, even though the phonographic process was functioning properly. So, room acoustic, performer noises such as coughing and page turning, background noises such as crickets or traffic, or noticeable edits and retakes. There are hundreds of examples of these, but I will play one containing um, as many of them as I, as, as I can find in one go. Uh, it's the start of the song Grievance by Daniel Johnston, recorded at, the home, uh, at his home and originally released on a cassette in 1980. And you can hear tape hiss, signal dropouts, Johnston coughing, muffled frequencies, room acoustic, and slightly sloppy piano technique. Johnston's, Johnston's high-pitched nasal voice and his less than smooth setting of the words to the melody also play a part in what makes this recording a particularly pronounced example of lo-fi. and ideologies of what would become lo-fi do not begin with the spread of home recording technology in the late 20th century, and the primitive lens through which, for example, Daniel Johnston's work was seen can be traced back to the early 19th century. The German philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder is credited with doing much to develop the category of the folk um, that a type of music would be named after. In 1773 he wrote, the more wild and freely acting a people is, the more wild that is, the more lively, free, sensuous and lyrically acting its songs must be. 
The farther from artificial scientific ways of thought, speech and letters a people is, the less its songs are made for paper and for dead literate verses. Heard a call for more folk songs, provincial songs, peasant songs, which would be equal in liveliness and rhythm and naive manner, and position them in contrast to the, quote, so-called culture, unquote, that threatened them. Um, <laughs> It was on such terms that jazz, blues, and rock were appreciated in the 20th century. Uh, but naturally, it was in folk music that these ideas held a particular sway and anti-commercial sentiment, since folk songs were being outcompeted by urban and commercial popular music at the time. During the mid-20th century, North America experienced a folk revival, which was the milieu in which Bob Dylan first became famous. Last year, I looked at some of the homemade magazines, or fanzines, active uh, during this folk re revival as part of the AHRC's International Placement Scheme at the Library of Congress. I very much recommend applying. The library's Folk Life Center holds rare copies of fanzines such as Caravan, Gardy Lou, and Little Sandy Review, which would voice sentiments such as, folk music is fun uh, to listen to and perform, especially when it is amateur and not professional. Um, and Superbly professional, our records were called superbly professional in the non-pejorative sense of the word as applied to folk music. Polished but completely free from any trace of slickness or commercialism. While the folk revivalists of the 1950s and 60s would encourage listeners to appreciate the cracking of a singer's voice or archaic performance techniques that might be normatively regarded as imperfect, they had little patience for recording quality on the whole. Uh, for, for poor recording quality on the whole, preferring the endangered folk songs to be uh, preserved as well as possible. However, there are some instances of folk writers finding recording imperfections to add something to the listening experience. One reviewer found that, quote, perhaps the most poignant sound on the record is the background roar of a tractor and passing automobiles, <laughs> because they represented the, uh, the passing of the folk age. Musical and technological imperfections became fully-fledged primitivisms in the climate of garage and punk rock in the 1960s and 70s, which favoured energetic, simplistic, and sometimes exotically uncommercial characteristics, very often invoking the word primitive in the process. Bands like the Velvet Underground performed and recorded with considerable levels of electrical distortion, and were praised for their human touch and realist perspective. Frank Zappa released a double album by mentally ill street performer Larry Wildman Fisher, and Lester Bangs wrote of the gods, a band who famously had no instrumental training, quote, sometimes they approximate that nth devolution of garage band the Fugs' Yorp to the point of squatting dog men sitting around the cannibal fire, unquote. <laughs> Easier to read than to, to read out his writing. Adding, quote, it was so awful I dug it. <laughs> As the 1970s became the 1980s, a number of similar musicians were discovered and their records reissued, including Hassel Atkins, The Shags, the legendary stardust cowboy and Rocky Erickson, all of whom came from rural areas. Uh, this was the context in which the term and category of lo-fi began to develop. I'll explain this picture in a second. Uh, and slowly the domain of primitive aesthetics was extended beyond a lack of normative instrumental or vocal technique and into a lack of normative recording capacity. New artists emerged, again from rural areas, in the newly formed discourse calling itself non-commercial, independent and indie, including Daniel Johnston, who I played, Jam Deck and the band Beat Happening. To research this, these artists, I took a trip to a 1980s fanzine archive at the New York State Library in Albany, in upstate New York. And in this picture, there are uh, more people than were there at the time when I visited. <laughs> very, very strange um, part of the world. Um, uh, Daniel Johnston, Jan Deck, and Beat Happening were regularly positioned as quintessentially authentic and heroically opposed to commercial norms, a stance that was seen to be reflected in their lo-fi effects and generally unsophisticated, as the OED put it, nature. You hear more emotion and raw nerve than you will hear from a million dollars worth of studio equipment, a million dollars more, wrote one reviewer of Daniel Johnston. Jandek single-handedly debunked some of the sacred rules of record making and music making in general. The fact that he refuses to play the game only serves to accentuate how hollow the game is. Beat Happening's Simple melodies and off-key vocals have a peculiar warming effect, especially in these days of high-tech wizardry. The band were like the kid who pointed out the emperor's nakedness. They strip away the layers of a rock and roll illusion. In the early 1990s, one album dramatically changed the landscape of independent popular music by selling in the millions, never mind my Nirvana. Uh, 
This album is not unrelated to lo-fi, it had a messy sound and the name of the genre it was associated with, grunge, referred to a kind of dirt and was often used to describe sounds and recordings. But in the wake of Nevermind, lo-fi became a way for musicians and listeners to differentiate themselves uh, from the encroaching commercialization of indie rock. With the reception of artists like Pavement, Sebado, Guided by Voices and Beck, lo-fi became a place for lackadaisical cool, avant-gardism, surreal non sequiturs and references to popular music history. The anti-commercialist stance remained. As one reviewer wrote, haphazardly recorded, full of as much snap and crackle as pop, the lo-fi output of bands such as Pavement and Sebado seems to indicate that they think a studio is merely the name for a small apartment. <laughs> Such willful dissonance is probably a reaction against the sterility of modern big-budget production. And in general, lo-fi was now more widely and internationally recognised than ever. The New York Times published several articles about the trend in the mid-1990s, one of which appeared under the headline, Lo-fi rockers opt for raw over slick. As the millennium turned, the category of lo-fi was constantly alluded to in popular music discourse, but its ideological element was more usually left implicit. In the mid noughties with the CD and other digital audio formats now ubiquitous, the aesthetic significance of lo-fi shifted towards analog technologies and the archaic. The imperfect analog frame of lo-fi became a way to sound evocatively retro, and the sonic fragility of analog formats such as tape and vinyl began to see, uh, be seen as a form of psychedelia and, as sounds made listeners nostalgic, a tragic metaphor for the passing of, of time. In order to emphasise this, lo-fi effects were dramatically intensified, often well beyond accidental necessity. This is a recording from around the year 2000 by the American singer-songwriter Aaron Pink. Pink's music reminded dozens of writers of AM radio. They also said that his music harked back to some lost pop Arcadia, that it had an instant patina of age, that the tunes haunt, and that the music is soaked in melancholy, the idea being that the greatest moments in life and pop are gone. <laughs> Yet the primitivist aesthetics of the 20th century had not disappeared. Their persistence was shown in 2012 with the response to the debut album of a new singer-songwriter, Willis L. Beale. <coughs> Beale's uh, example is particularly notable because his record, table, uh, record label took a number of measures to make him appear more primitive and lo-fi than he really was. For example, designing a website that looked as if he had hand-drawn it and encouraging him to perform in front of a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine um, that was actually much older than he was. Um, despite this, writers frequently emphasised Beale's authenticity, calling him nothing but real, uh, while some of them began to question his authenticity as too good to be true. He was even called allegedly lo-fi. Despite, <laughs> despite its anti-commercial and realist beginnings in the 1980s then, in Willis L. Beale, lo-fi had become a kind of branding. With electronic music on laptops and even smartphones offering much easier access to music making than even the cheapest cassette recorders did, lo-fi is beginning to decline as a mode of music making for those outside of the music industry, even with its added analog charm. But the development and expression of lo-fi aesthetics shed important light, I believe, on some of the most fundamental currents that have seen anti-commercial ideologies and aesthetics intertwined since Romanticism, especially in a more recent and under-researched area. In doing so, it invites us to call into question the apparently progressive claims, narratives and constructions surrounding non-commercial and anti-commercial musics, such as the way it enshrines music made, away from, uh, music made from a culturally and technologically disadvantaged position. In looking uh, beyond quote-unquote pop, it is my hope that this research contributes to a more complex, nuanced and historically informed popular music studies. Thank you very much.